doing research for a number of years, so I've kind of packed a lot of stuff from several different years together here. Um, I guess that's kind of the disadvantage if you have, the first time you have a research symposium, those of us who have been doing research for several years, try to cram everything in. So, ah, there we go. So the diseases that I've looked at, I've looked at powdery mildew and downy mildew of cucurbits. I've looked at foliar diseases of tomato, phytophthor blight and cucurbits, and then most recently I've gotten involved with downy mildew in basil. And all of the experiments that I'm doing, I'm not artificially inoculating them. So it's all natural inoculum that's occurring in the area. I do have one research block where I am that is a, a field that we allow phytophthor blight to develop. So that is one where we've kind of encouraged it in the soil. And, uh, whoops, now it's going to go too fast. So kind of my so since I do have a lot of studies pulled together, I'm going to give you just kind of general procedures of what I've done. I'm mostly working in, in organic research fields for these trials. We now have two blocks that we use for organic research. Where I am, I'm located down on Long Island at a Cornell facility. Um, so most of my studies are conducted there. We have one block where we only have uh, organically approved products that are used. These are not certified blocks. And then the other one, we will look at products that are maybe not yet certified, and, um, and th those experiments that will also often have a conventional fungicide just as a mark of what level of disease control I can achieve. So two research blocks, one's, that, one's been in organic research for a lot longer than the other one. Most of my treatments, I start either before we've seen symptoms or right at first symptoms. And that's because plant diseases Unlike an insect, an insect you can kill with an insecticide. A plant disease, that spot on the leaf, you cannot eliminate it. So it's really important to start treatments before or right at the start of a disease to really get effective control. Most of my treatments are going out, they're going out weekly. Most of them are going out with a backpack sprayer and sometimes my powdery mildew work with cucurbits. I've got large enough plots that I am working with a tractor sprayer. And then we're assessing severity weekly. So some of the treatments I've looked at. Mostly I have looked at biopesticides, and most biopesticides are approved for organic production. So it's a really good fit. There's a research program uh, that funds research on biopesticides that are either already registered to help demonstrate them, help get information out to organic farmers, and it also is looking at, at evaluating new products that are coming along to help support their development. So that's another reason that I've looked at biopesticides, because it's a really good source of funding for this work. I've also included copper fungicides. Some of my treatments are biopesticides, either tank mixed with the copper, both used at a low rate, or alternated with the copper. I've looked at sulfur, mineral oil. Um, as I commented earlier, I often have a conventional fungicide just to give me a measure of how well can I control this particular disease um, with, with but something a, a conventional non-organic grower would be using, assuming that that kind of a product would be more effective, is the assumption there. And then sometimes I've had uh, projects where I am looking at an integrated management program. So I'm looking at biopesticides, organic products, applied to a resistant variety to see if that integrated approach gives me better control. Oops, be careful of these buttons. So just a little background on what biopesticides are, in case those some of you don't know. Um, this is based upon, this is using the term as defined by USP, uh, the US EPA, they've defined the term in 1994, and so they're looking at pesticides that are derived from natural materials, mostly um, what we're looking at with organic. So they've got three major classes, two fit well with organic, which would be the, their microbial kind of products, and biochemical products that are naturally occurring substances. And then obviously the third group of biopesticides, a plant incorporated uh, protectant, it's genetically engineered, would not be organic. So most things are suitable for organic production, but not all. Um, website for the IR4 program, they've got a biopesticide support uh, program. I, as I mentioned, this is where I've gotten a lot of my funding. I've kind of arrowed two spots on their main program that might be of interest um, to you folks. One where you could submit a request if you know of a product that's not le yet labeled for a, a, a disease that you're interested in seeing managed by it. You can submit a request and say this needs to get looked at. And then the other is that you can search their database for uh, projects that have been done and data that's out there. So just two spots on their webpage I thought might be of interest. To you?
So some, some microbial fungicides that are, that are biopesticides. I'm going to go over a couple uh, lists here. They include products that I've looked at. If I looked at them, they're in yellow. If I haven't looked at them, they're in green. This is just to give you a feel for how many products are out there as well as what I've actually looked at. So quite a few micro, microbial fungicides. These are all products that have a microbe as the base. Um, a lot of them, it is a biocontrol agent that is going after the pathogen. But we get into some products, and actually they're mostly on the next slide here. The serenades and the sonatas, where it's an organism that is producing a compound, and that is acting as the, as the, as the um, pesticide. So serenade and sonata, the organism during fermentation is producing a lipopeptide, and it's those lipopeptides that are actually doing the biocontrol. Uh, or doing the, the control rather. So you've got traditional biocontrol type products in this group and products that have an organism that is producing something that's acting on the pathogen. So quite a few microbial fungicides. Here are some of the biochemical fungicides, the naturally occurring substances that are out there. I've looked at some potassium bicarbonate products. I've looked at oxidate, which is a hydrogen dioxide. A couple other things that I have not looked at. Um, Oops, sorry, went the wrong direction. Problem with all these buttons on this thing, it's hard to keep track. Another group is the biochemical type of fungicides. A lot of them are botanical oil kind of products. There's also in the center there, regalia, which is uh, an extract of a plant that's a giant knotweed. Um, so you can see these are all in yellow. I have looked at all of these products in various uh, tests. They are all registered in the US except for the last one, that tea tree oil, and that is coming. And there are some other organic fungicides that are not biopesticides. And this just kind of shows you how many of those biopesticides are organic, approved for organic use um, versus the few other organic fungicides that are not biopesticides that you could use. So copper, sulfur, um, mineral type, and petroleum type oils are not biopesticides. They're not naturally occurring compounds. Whoops. Um, so now to move on to the diseases that I've looked at and some of the results I've gotten. Um, powdery mildew, very common disease. If you grow cucurbits, you are going to see powdery mildew. Um, occurs every year. It's hitting the leaves, it's not hitting the fruit. So often the thought is, well, you know, I can tolerate that because it's taking away the leaves. But what will, what will end up happening is the plants will die prematurely. Summer squash and, and zucchini will definitely see a reduction in production. With the other things, you're going to see a reduction in fruit quality. So melons will not have the sugars they normally would have if, if the plants didn't have powdery mildew or if it was controlled. Um, so you won't have as good quality fruit. And the winter squashes uh, also don't have the sugars, don't quite have the flavor, and they won't store as well if, if they come from a plant that's been severely affected by powdery mildew. Long distance wind dispersed spores, that's why we see it every year, um, easily moves around. It, it has a sexual stage that can survive over winter, um, might be important, might not, because there's so many wind dispersed spores. And it does have other hosts. It goes to verbena in particular. Oops. Ah, these buttons are a nuisance. There we go. Um, so managing, all we've got for tools for managing powdery mildew, because you can't avoid it, is resistant varieties and fungicides. Um, they vary a lot in their efficacy and cost. Some of the ones that I've seen that are best, and I'll, I'll show you some data in a minute, um, JMS Stylet Oil, Organic Side has been some of my best. Um, I like to start early. The threshold I work with is finding one of 50 older leaves that I look at having symptoms. Um, separating successive plantings and rotating might help a little bit, but really what we're looking at is resistant varieties and fungicides for control. So I'm going to um, jump way back in time. Um, so some of my first trials starting in 2001, at some of the products I looked at. Most of my tables are going to be percent control. So the bigger the number, the better. And most of the time, anytime you see an A with statistical analysis, it means it's not significantly different from the control. Sometimes the control has some other let letters. But figure anytime you see an A, it's not significantly different. So the first thing to notice with this first group of products in this trial is I've got better control on the upper leaf surface than the lower leaf surface. And that's just because of the big pumpkin leaf. It's really hard to drive the spray material to the underside. Um, but on the upper leaf surface, all the products are indeed effective. They're giving me some level of control. 
Um, next one I looked at was copper hydroxide. Um, in this trial, I did not have an organic formulation. As you can see, I've, I've gotten, now I'm up to a, a higher level of control on the upper surface of the leaves. And now some products that are organic, and they're giving me even better control on the upper leaf surface and better control on the lower leaf surface. See, we've got some higher numbers. Um, and then comparing to a conventional product, Bravo, I've got slightly better control on the upper leaf surface, but 93% control versus 98. I don't think that's um, a major difference. But um, interestingly, note that with the mineral oil and the sulfur, I have better control than with the Bravo. So there's a case with some organic products where I'm getting better control than with a conventional product. Um, and the other one to point out is the Milsana that's been reformulated and renamed Real Gallia is the product that's out now. Um, here's some data also on powdery mildew control in pumpkins, 2004, 2005, 2006, put together. Ba basically listed in order of efficacy um, with some of the best products here at the bottom, this Eco Erase and Organicide, those are botanical oils, not significantly different from the conventional product Bravo. So more data showing that some of these organic products are at least as good as what a conventional grower can, uh, can get. Um, so some very good control. This is all control in the upper leaf surface. Um, oxidate is the one that, that I had, did not have control with. You can see there's an A with the, um, next to it, percent control. One that didn't, has not worked for me. Um, and it, anybody who's had, works with any of these products, when we get to the discussion at the end, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, what other people's um, feelings have been, what they found. Um, next data is looking at um, having a susceptible variety or a resistant variety or an integrated program. So the first three lines are looking at a, a organic fungicide, a biopesticide applied to a susceptible variety compared to the resistant variety not treated at all. And you can see there's no significant differences. So we're getting as good control with a biopesticide applied to a susceptible variety compared to the resistant variety. And then interesting looking at pumpkin versus butternut squash. Sometimes I see this where you see Millstop did not work on the pumpkin, but it worked really well on the butternut. I've got 89% control. Um, and then Organicide was, was pretty much equal level of control with the two. So sometimes that happens, which I find very interesting, and I, I, I can't give you an answer for that. The next two lines are looking at the biopesticide applied to a resistant variety, and now we're looking at the control relative to the resistant variety alone. So looking at how much additional control do I get with an integrated program. With Millstop, I did not gain control. With Organocide, you can see I've increased the control 51, 40%. Um, so an integrated program, sometimes you can really get a boost to the amount of control and I can demonstrate that. And that is what I would recommend as, as the best way to be managing these diseases. It's a nice integrated program. Whoops. Um, next disease to cover is downy mildew. Um, this is a disease that was sporadic until uh, about 2004 where we now have a new strain, so we're seeing it much more often. The, we're looking at the underside of the leaf in this picture, and it, it's showing the contrast with the spore colors, with downy mildew being a very dark spore, and then that white powdery growth, that's powdery mildew. So just to distinguish the two, powdery mildew, downy mildew. And downy mildew, when it moves through the leaves, when it hits the veins, it can't progress any further, which is why we see those, that uh, kind of angle, angular look to it. So just to, to distinguish the two. So downy mildew, like powdery mildew, it's got long distance wind dispersed spores, but conditions are not always favorable for the spores to move, to survive transportation, to land somewhere and, and, and give rise to infection. And that's why we see downy mildew a lot more sporadically different times than powdery mildew, whereas powdery mildew will come in right at the, the um, start of, of the plant getting into the reproductive stage usually. Downy mildew can't survive over winter. There's no other uh, crop hosts. Um, and because of this new strain, the resistant varieties of cucumber are no longer as um, resistant as they used to be. But they still are a valuable tool. And this is some data from a study where I'm looking at an integrated approach. So all of the varieties except the last one um, have resistance to the old strains of, of downy mildew. 
We're now looking at severity, not percent control. So the smaller the number, the better. And this whole field got a weekly treatment of organicide plus an organic copper. And you can see the severity is ranging up to 8.4% with the resistant varieties versus 52% with an old variety that has no resistance to downy mildew. So clearly an integrated program, you can get some decent control uh, of downy mildew, I think. So now we're looking at some efficacy trials that I've done on various biopesticides. Here's some data from 2009. I'm shifting back now to percent control. On um, the previous slide, I didn't have percent control, so I didn't have anything to compare it to. But now I've got a non-treated plots out in my trial to, to compare it to. Um, so these are also roughly listed in, in the level of control on that particular assessment date. Um, and if you see an A, it's insignificant. So in this trial, Serenade Max was not effective for me. Um, Sportec gave pretty good control. Then um, I have a treatment with organocide plus copper, and those are both at low labeled rates. Um, that one also gave pretty good control. Um, in particular, the Sportec and the copper are not significantly different from conventional fungicides that a, a conventional grower would use, the Manzate and the Bravo. So some products giving us pretty good control, um, but a range. And I think that's what I've seen across the board with a number of these things I've looked at. And I think that's another important thing to point out. You know, why do I do all these trials? A lot of it is to find the most effective products for, to let growers know, but also because in the United States, to get a product registered, you do not need efficacy data. So there is not necessarily efficacy data behind products that are registered. And I think that's a really important thing to realize. It's, in most other countries, efficacy data is required for registration. Um, but here in the U.S., it's strictly safety of the product. Um, so very important reason why we need to do these efficacy trials. Um, this is just a picture of a plant in my own home garden over um, 11 days just to show how fast downy mildew can move. Um, a number of diseases can be like this, and I think that's important to keep in mind. That's why, one of the reasons why you, you've absolutely got to start, if you're going to use biopesticides or, or other organic fungicides, you've got to start at first symptoms and, and be right out there. You can't, you can't wait, e even at this stage. You know, you cannot, there's no fungicide that's going to get rid of the spots that are already there, and um, it's a, it's a never-ending battle if you start late. So you've got to start early. Basal downy mildew. Um, a brand new disease brought into the United States in October of 2007. Our sources are infested seed and wind dispersed spores. There are no other hosts that it goes to. This is one that I have seen every year since it first got here, so that, and including in my home garden. That tells me we've got spores that are easily moving around every year and that there's lots of them. So here to stay, unfortunately. Um, just kind of a general look at the plants. They can just kind of look yellow. Um, and just that maybe their nutrition's not quite right. Um, so this is from our very first year. In fact, this was an organic farmer on Long Island, and, and he thought there was something up with the nutrition of the crop. He didn't look closely enough to realize he had a disease, and, and partly because we didn't know we had a new disease then. So what does it look like? Oh, these buttons are long. Let me get back to where we were. Okay. So on the upper leaf surface, classically what we see is this yellow banding. So you can see the bands between the veins. So just like downy mildew in cucumber, the pathogen cannot move beyond the veins. So we see this banding look of yellowing. And then if you flip over the leaves, you see the characteristic spores of downy mildew. And they look a lot like the, the brown to almost blackish, purplish color of the spores that we see with cucumber downy mildew. Uh, very different pathogens, but very similar look and behavior. And this downy mildew can go just right up the stem. So you see there's some sporulations right up on the sepals by the flowers. And you can also see how quickly the leaves uh, become necrotic and die. So very, it can be very fast, very devastating. Um, close up of what the sporulation looks like on the underside of the leaves. And even closer, just, I thought it would be good to throw in one um, close up just to give you a feel for what spores can look like with a downy mildew. So here's the structure if you're looking at, through a dissecting microscope or with a good hand lens. And then really close, you can see those spores. And you can just tell those are the kind of things that wind comes along, they're going to get blown all over the place. So some efficacy data. I've put together trials from 2010 and 2011. These are the two years that I've done work looking at various um, biopesticides for basal downy mildew. 
And the first thing you're going to notice is that um, nothing worked. Um, a much tougher disease, I think, to go after. And both years, conditions were just really favorable for basal downy mildew, which I think made it more difficult as well. Um, I, sometimes with diseases, I look at various different ways to try to evaluate them. So here I've got leaves affected, because certainly an affected leaf, no matter how affected it is, it isn't going to be useful. It's going to be a little hard to market. And then I've looked at severity as well. Um, there's two white stars, and those indicate the only two of the products that I looked at that are labeled for this use. So that's the other thing. We're looking at a new disease, so there isn't much labeled yet. And that's part of the reason for doing this study, was to help get the kind of information that these uh, companies needed to help promote thinking about getting products labeled. But unfortunately, I'm not finding anything that's, that's really working yet at this point in time. Um, so that's, I guess, of the two products that I looked at that are labeled, numbers are looking a little bit lower for actinovate than for oxidate. So just kind of for general of management would be to start with uh, disease-free seed and be scouting for symptoms. Um, I do maintain a, a, a national program of, of, of where you can log occurrences and see where else downy mildew is, is occurring just to kind of help you in, in managing the disease to know where it already is. And um, here, there are two other products you'll see in this list that are, list, that are labeled and that you can use in New York for um, this disease. And I think another thing that you can do that you can't do with any of the other diseases that I talked about already, and that's harvesting early. So if you realize that downy mildew of basil has just appeared in your crop or you hear it's in an area, just get out there and harvest the basil. Don't try to fight it. So here's one I'm, I'm giving you results on biopesticides, but I'm now saying maybe this is one you don't want to try to combat um, with biopesticides. You want to just harvest it if you can. All right, so now moving to the last topic that I'll cover of the trials that I've looked at are tomato foliar diseases, and I've been looking at a number of them um, over the years, a number of different trials. What I see most commonly on Long Island is Powdery mildew and septoria leaf spot. Actually, septoria leaf spot probably a little bit more than powdery. Sometimes we see bacterial speck, and I don't see early blight on Long Island quite as much as I see these other diseases. Our conditions aren't quite the same as upstate um, here for, you, for those of you who are from upstate. Um, okay, so some of my first uh, results and data I, uh, studies I did back in 2004. Um, kind of my, my just topic and what I was interested in doing then was looking at a compost tea, um, looking at a biopesticide that was out then, Sonata, and then looking at combinations. So looking at com compost tea used with the biopesticide, Sonata, and then used with rescue fungicides where once I first saw symptoms, I'd come in with a, a fungicide that was most appropriate for that disease. So I was using the styling oil, the mineral oil for powdery mildew, and coppers for any of the other diseases that I saw. And as you can see, there's no letters next to the numbers, which means there were no significant differences. So in that trial, I didn't see any significant differences for controlling powdery mildew, nor for bacterial spec, um, and also no, no significant differences for septorial leaf spots. So sometimes these diseases can be just really hard to control, or maybe partly it's to find, see a difference that you can, that you can quantify. <coughs> because when I got to the end of the season and I looked at the plant, oh, and also no differences in defoliation. When I looked at the plants, here are non-treated, and here are ones that got the compost tea trial. And I, and the compost tea and the rescue fungicides, I thought those leaves, those plants, were looking better than these, but it just didn't end up having it documented. So sometimes you might be seeing some level of control with these treatments, but it's just not a hard thing to get quantified. Um, most recent trials, last data I'll, I'll share with you, powdery mildew and septoria leaf spot um, occurred in the most recent trials I've done. This is 2008. So we're looking at incidence of leaves with powdery mildew. And in this trial, I'm looking now at a lot more biopesticides, and I am seeing some good efficacy, particularly for powdery mildew. Um, so conventional standard, organocide, and, and the, the copper I used are not significantly different at all of those different assessment dates. And some pretty low numbers and significance for all the treatments that I looked at. The one at the top, the Tegro, that at this point is just labeled for root diseases, so that's 
One of the few that I looked at that's not labeled for, for um, foliar diseases yet. But pretty low numbers with powdery mildew severity, or incidence rather, keep that in mind. Now we look at septorial leaf spot incidence. So these are the same plant, same trial, and you'll see the numbers are a little bit higher. Um, so not getting a, a little more disease. This is percent control. This is the amount of disease that's present. So not quite as good control. Um, but a lot of the times I'm seeing letters that are, are you know, a lot of C's, C's, D's here, whereas it's an A for the non-treated. So I am seeing some control, some products working. Um, uh, now looking at some combination things, and I'm starting to see some improved control. So take regalia or regalia alternated with copper, and you can see significantly better control of, of septoria leaf spot. There's less septoria there. Sporatech or Sporatech plus safety side, a lot less disease. Um, and then also organocide at its full labeled rate or organocide at half that rate plus copper, it's significantly better control. So sometimes these, these combination programs are going to give us better control. And I think that's a good way to, to reduce the amount of copper you use to combine it with a biopesticide. Um, now, keeping in mind 2008 data and now going to 2009, which for, for us was a really wet year, and you can see much higher numbers, a lot less control um, that year. But still, still seeing some um, things that are there. So just to kind of summarize, we get to um, just kind of a general statement of my results. Um, I, I think we can definitely conclude that plant diseases can be difficult to manage at times. I think the powdery mildews are most effectively suppressed with organic fungicides, be it in um, cucurbits or in tomatoes. I think it's very important to start early in disease development. And you know, if you're going to use biopesticides, you want to be right on it when the disease first starts. And be applying regularly. An integrated program is often better. And um, this is just kind of my summary of, of some of the products that look the best for me in my treatments. I'll leave this my last slide up to answer any questions that you have. Um, realize in my trials, I'm not always looking at all things possible that are labeled. Um, so there may be something else that's out there that's even better than what I've looked at. But these are some of the things um, that just came from my slides that I've shown you that, that look the best. And do we have a minute or two for questions? Yes? Have I done any trials with root shield? I have not done any trials with the root um, apply going after root pathogens, at least out in the field. I've started to do some work in the greenhouse going after fusarium, but I, I, I didn't feel that was a, appropriate to talk about today. Um, but no, I haven't gotten into those. Yes? Uh, one small, uh, I, I have a different understanding about the, the requirements for efficacy for EPA registration. What I've been told is that the, by, by people who, who register pesticides is that the data are still required. However, the EPA no longer has any authority to deny registration based on lack of efficacy. So they so, so the required data, for efficacy. The, the date, yeah. So there's there's no there's a requirement for efficacy data, but there's no requirement that it be effective. They they have to do trials. Yeah, they have to show, it. yeah. And it's, they, it's they how, how, how much how embarrassed they they get when they sell this stuff. So so the qu the question is is about you know the requirements for efficacy data, the efficacy data being used by EPA to make decisions yeah. or not in registration. They, they and some of the efficacy data may strictly be in a petri dish, and I have often seen that. Yeah. And it is really easy to control a pathogen in a petri dish or in, in just a lab setting. When you take it out into the field, it becomes a lot more difficult pathogen to control. Um, I, my understanding was that they didn't need any data at all. So it, it's interesting to hear your comments, and I appreciate hearing that, yes, they're required to submit some, the EPA may not look at it. EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, their whole um, reason to be is to protect the environment, and I think that's why they don't look at efficacy data anymore. It doesn't fit with their mandate. Um, so we'll take one more question, and then um, we'll have time at the end. I'll let you pick who. All right, uh, in the back. Is styling oil labeled as a fungicide? Is styling oil labeled as a fungicide? Yes, it is. 
Um, it was designed for controlling viruses, so that is its, thus the stylet oil, style, referring to the stylet of, of an aphid. Um, so it is one that's good for controlling aphids and virus-borne diseases. And yes, it is labeled for, for fungus, as a fungicide and, a, and other insects as 